back uh, to the studio. We are now being joined by uh, Mrs. Abiodun Eset, who is the Senior Special Assistant uh, to the President on Community Engagement in North Central. She will be speaking to us on the electorate and representation and ways of navigating Nigeria's electoral challenges for better governance in the country. At a time where there is so much economic downturn and hardship is biting harder on Nigerians day by day. You're very much welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you join us in the studio. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Well, very quickly, you are the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Community Engagement North Central. Yes. And uh, I, I believe part of what you do as an SSA is to ensure that people at the grassroots sort of get the dividends of democracy that they voted for at the polls at a time when most people say that politicians just get elected, they go in there and they shut their doors against the electorates. Mm. Is that true? No. So first, the, I need to thank Mr. President for creating the Office of Community Engagement because it's the office that was created to get the voiceless in government, to get their feedback on government policies and laws, and that's what we're doing. Yes. So we have six of us across the region so i'm representing the north central we have other ssas that are community engagement that are also representing other regions our work is simple our work is to get feedback for members of the community on issues that they are facing now we have four price hike so we are getting all those feedback so that the president understand exactly what is going on in the community and he uses those feedback to change policies and laws and also instructs the ministers to also use some of those feedbacks to really change some of their work and you know modes of operandos yes. for better governance and also for our people to benefit from the dividends of democracy all right well well you have sort of captured it in a very elaborate manner the work that you do uh, yeah. for the presidency and for the benefit of Nigerians as well, which is quite um, uh, quite commendable. But I would want you to hold your thoughts. I'm coming back to you with more questions on the program. Uh, we will also be joined virtually at this moment uh, by Mr. Mark Amaza, who is a Senior Communications Officer at Yaga Africa. Hello and good morning, Mr. Mark, if you can hear me. I hear you very well. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. All right, very, very, very quickly. Um, it's not news that Nigerians are disgruntled about the current full situation in the country with a new pump price, uh, opposition parties like the People's Democratic Party, the NLC, uh, President Comrade Joe Ajero said that the presidency betrayed him by increasing the full pump price after an agreement that was reached during their closed-door meeting for a 70,000 Naira minimum wage with the promise of not increasing the new full pump price. Now, all of these things that are happening at the very top also have daunting effects on people at the grassroots. Firstly, I want to get your take on this developments that are bedeviling Nigerians at this very, very tough period. Yeah, without doubt, Nigeria, we are going through really tough economic times, perhaps the, even perhaps for sure, the tough, toughest in a generation or more. Um, and, you know, this recent increase in fuel price will inevitably um, make things more difficult, you know, rising high, very high inflation, you have, you know, um, which is, which captures as a whole, the situation in Nigeria and factors that the high fuel price are feeding to that. Um, it's I think it, for me, for us, it's incumbent on the government to continue to listen to what people are saying, to what the people are saying, and not um, leave in a bubble around thinking these ideas are the best ideas we have and we have we, that we, um, put forward it without looking to see okay, what are we are people going through. We might look at the numbers and see them as just um, statistics, but behind each of these statistics, there are individual lives that are being impacted by it. People who are unable to make uh, ends meet, who are able to, unable to put um, trees covers on the table, who are able to commute to work and back comfortably because of how because of how they are being squeezed by the unjust economic situation. Well, well, uh, you you mentioned that people are finding it difficult to commute to work and back. Let's relate this now to governance uh, in, in the country. Uh, people elect 
these politicians or leaders into power with the hopes that they are going to go there to better their lives. But somehow it appears that day by day, people are finding it more and more difficult to experience the dividends of, of democracy that they have voted for. In, in your opinion, how does party crisis, like what is currently going on in the PDP and what is currently going on in the Labour Party, how does this affect or impede the, the actions of these elected individuals in ensuring that the dividends of democracy that they are supposed to deliver to their people are delivered, considered, considering that somehow they are being strangulated by party internal crisis? So there's a huge divide in Nigeria between politicians and people, and it reflects itself even in this crisis you mentioned. These crises are not around ideology, they're not around fights to say um, this is a better approach to delivering governance or um, approaches and solving certain problems, but they often seem or are fights for control of party structures and to have what and that has a direct impact in on governance. It seems like it seems a lot of times that politicians want to have power just for the sake of having power for the betterment of themselves and not to improve lives of the people. The biggest marketed tool for democracy is good governance. And this reflects itself a lot of times in declining voter turnout we have, where it becomes harder and harder to convince people, citizens to turn out and vote when they do not when they cannot um, draw a straight line from the votes they have cast before and an improvement in their lives, which is often lacking. Until we have that happen, it becomes it's for us in civil society we we because it doesn't seem like our politicians pay close attention to that. But for us, we, we look at the numbers, and it's a, it's a thing of concern, where in every election cycle, you have that declining voter turnout. And when you go on the street and talk to people, increasingly they tell you, why do you need to come out and vote? Increasingly, they have people who, who the only incentive for them to vote is to collect, um, to sell their vote, which itself is wrong. And no matter how much you need the argument for them that you're selling your vote, selling your franchise, you're selling your rights or your to to make a direct um, uh, impact on governance in terms of choosing who leads you, they will also look at the times where they do not sell their votes and say, but look at what those politicians are doing. That divide, this divide I've mentioned between our politicians and the people, something that needs to be bridged hugely. Um, and then because we, I look at, for example, or you might like to look at the crisis in this part and ask yourself, but how does this benefit me? How does this impact my life? Because a lot of times, or every time, the fights are not around, or oh, this is, um, we are failing in this regard because this approach is not working. And on that wing of the party saying, no, this approach is the best, it's almost always about how of one or two percent or groups of people trying to control party structures, trying to um, um, entrench themselves in the party in terms of so they're able to control who emerges as candidates, who are able to you know, emerge as person, members of government and not for the sake of benefiting the people. All, all right, Mr. Mark, uh, I will just hold you there. And coming back to you uh, in the studio, uh, Mrs. Abiodun Esiet, uh, in the last elections, we saw a sudden surge in you know, voter participation, especially amongst young people in the country. Initially, before now, there was some sort of apathy amongst electorates. People would not want to go out to vote because according to them, even if you go out to vote, Somehow, INF will just install whoever they want or, or whoever pays the highest amount of money. But in the last election, it sort of seemed a little bit different with hopes that the current administration or the presidency coming into power would sort of ease the sufferings of, of, of Nigerians. But with all of these happenings, the hashtag end bad governance protests that took place, the many, many negative reports coming in from different quarters of the country, insecurity ravaging the northwestern part of the country, and now recently, most recent, we are seeing the fuel crisis in the country. Do you think that perhaps the political or voter apathy that we have been seeing for decades in the country will eventually return come 2027, when the next elections will hold? Because it appears that people are losing faith in the system. Thank you very much for that. Democracy is beyond voting. That must be understood by everyone. Yes. After you elect someone into office, you must also hold them accountable to whatever you have elected them to do. 
And governance is not only by the president. There are three levels of government. Exactly. The presidency, the state government, and also the local government. Recently, we had a pronunciation about local government autonomy, which is a plus to the government, saying that, okay, we want governance to be felt at the local level. When your streets road is bad, it's not the responsibility of the president. So we need to keep orientating our people for them to understand the level of governance and who is to be held accountable. When I got into office as an SSC and community engagement, I did a study on the perception of people about government. And I understood that there's a lack of trust between the people and the government, not just something that started at this administration. It has been since the era when we took over in power of democracy yes. for 25 years. Yes. Because people come to power and they don't fulfill their mandate. And now there's a lack of trust. And I started what is called citizen assembly. It's an assembly where we have volunteers across the North Central region for them to have their voices, the governors. So we have over 500 volunteers in the North Central region who are across the words of the North Central region, sending feedback to us about what is going on in their community. And we are all working together to co-create the community we want. And that's governance. We need to also sensitize people about this is the responsibility of you as a citizen. It's not just about when you elect people into power, then you sit down and watch how governance is all about. So you must act and also participate in the governance, and that's what we're encouraging people. In, in, in participating in governance, I, I, I believe that the um, well, majority of Nigerians do not really know their role or what role they are meant to play. Yeah, in, that's why we started in, the Citizen Assembly. Exactly. But away from that, in terms of holding these elected officials accountable for their actions or inactions, yeah. for not providing the... the basic amenities that people need in this in their communities or in the cities what is the role of the electorate and are there proper channels via which these electorates can hold elected officials accountable for these actions or inactions okay first i've said about the citizen assembly is the platform we have created to hold uh, our electorate our decision makers accountable to yes. whatever they are meant to do Another one is also building the capacity. The civil societies have been doing so many. Yaga has been doing a whole lot yes. for seeing how to educate people and also providing platform for holding decision makers accountable. When I was in the local governance, we started a movement, local governance, open local governance. Uh, we started what we call open governance partnership, OGP. And when I was at SA to the AMAC chairman, we sign up AMAC into OGP, which is a partnership between us, government, and also members of civil society to hold one another accountable to transparency and accountability. Nigeria as a country has also been part of OGP, and they've signed up with members of civil society organizations to say, this is what we are going to do together. Hold us accountable. That's number two. That's, the, that's another channel to hold people accountable. But people are not aware about that. And I think the first thing is for us to really educate ourselves about the different rules of government so that we hold, we know what we are fighting for. You know, during the end bad governance process, there were some demands that not really the responsibility of the president, really. There are some that should be channeled to National Assembly. There are some that should be channeled to other forms of government. For instance, when I get to the community, and I said I'm from the federal government, they will be sharing, they will be discussing things that a local government should be able to do. And, you know, we keep educating them that, no, this is not the work of federal government. Federal government will not come down to come and do the work of a local government to them. So, so, so they, need to be, they need to also be aware about what they are supposed to do. And it's about creating channels. And it's an opportunity and a call to action for all our elected officials. To create a channel, we have FOI, Freedom of Information Act, that's been signed into law. For them to anywhere you are, any government agency, any information you want to get, you can write to those government agencies and say, okay, we need this information. You write it and get it and use that to hold them accountable. The Follow the Money is also an initiative of, uh, of uh, code, which is also is being used to hold government accountable, releasing uh, projects, releasing budgets, releasing funds of, of any project and saying this is the funds that have been provided. So in my own office as well, I've also identified all the projects in the North Central region which are made accessible to all our volunteers across the North Central region so that they can follow up all those projects and make sure it is done. And if it's not done, we also use my office to write letters to those agencies, making sure that the money that has been budgeted for, budgeted for that has been released 
should be implemented. We have constituency projects by different members of National Assembly, which we are also following up and also encouraging our volunteers to also do the same. So it's, so it's, for, it's a call to action for, for the elected officials to, to know the platform that is available for, for the citizens. Yeah, for the citizens to checkmate them. We are a member of OGP. We should use that platform. We have FOI Act. We should use that platform. Citizens should know the platform available. They should, nobody should seize your voice in holding any government accountable. Now, now, now you, you are doing a fantastic job holding these elected officials accountable, following up their constituency projects and ensuring that from start to finish, they pull through with their promises. Absolutely. And uh, if we look at it critically, we all know the corruption embedded, uh, or, uh, embedded in the Nigerian system yeah. from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Local government chairman, members of the House of assembly in states you know elected members of the house of representatives or senators certainly we will not call names but corruption is there it's deeply rooted in the system how do we read the system of the corrupt practices by these officials or elected officials in collaboration with maybe private sector contractors who are given this contract to you know carry out constituency projects and eventually end up not doing it? How can we checkmate this to read so the we, system? So we have ICPC there, also monitoring the constituency projects. Yes. We have ESCC there as well, also monitoring all those things. And it's about see, when you see something, say something. Yes. The, the National Assembly members that you're also talking about, they also give those contracts to private individuals like you and I, yes. who are also part of the problem, who also bribe a civil servant and say, okay, pass this file. It's also part of the problem. So we should not think, okay, everything about Nigeria or everything about governance is about the politician. It's a system that we need to be sincere about if we really want to make it work. Be be because yeah. mo mo most people sort of mistake lobby, uh, mistake bribery for lobbying. Hmm. You can lobby. Yeah. It's legal to lobby, but hmm. it is very illegal to bribe people. Where do it's you illegal where, when they say you should use 30 million to do a road and you don't actually use that. And a, they said you should be the quota should be one inches. Yes. And you made it average. That's corruption, and it's all private sector. No, no, there, that. There's a very, right. there's a very thin line. You are accusing the private sector. <laughs> no, 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 it's a joint because, venture. Because, because no, it's, it's not about the private. Venture. It's a joint venture. You can't say it's about it's governance. It's about everybody. Exactly. It's about the stakeholder, the private sector, the individual on the road that will pass is the student of a rich man without to, the person sitting for exam. It's all about we and our, us. It's, the change has to be from us. We need to change the narrative of how people should understand how governance is all about. That's why we're empowering people with tools, necessary tools, for them to know how they, this is the total amount of money budgeted for this road in your constituency. And this is the speculation, bill of quantities that is meant to do. This is what is meant to happen on your road. Then follow it up. That is what we're empowering our citizens to do. I'm in government. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm also empowering our citizens to, yeah. to hold us accountable because that's all the reality of governance. But we should not boss government to say, okay, it's all about the people in power. It's a system. It's, you about, have the it's about everybody. Yeah, you have the people, you have the civil servant, you have the private sector that are also bidding for contracts, are also getting the contract, who are also like you and I. It's a, so respons it's all a responsibility of the elected, and, yes. the elected and the electorate. Absolutely. I, I would want you to hold your thoughts there, uh, uh, Mrs. Abiodun. Let me go back to Mr. Mike, who is still with us virtually. You've listened to her assertions and takes with regards to governance and the role of everybody involved from the very top to the least in power. The elected have responsibilities, the electorates have responsibilities. Now at Yaga, you, you I believe um, the organization is doing a lot in terms of you know community engagement, sensitization and all of that. But I want you to also give us an, an in-depth uh, explanation into your activities there and how you have been able to you know engage people especially in communities where perhaps it, it appears that they are not experiencing uh the needed uh governance or government presence that they are supposed to experience all right thank you for that question i agree with Ms. Esed Abaraga regarding a lot of the things she has said uh, the lack of trust is very pervasive in nigeria regarding how we engage with government a um, lot of citizens yes have um, do not know, um, do not have adequate knowledge around which level of government is responsible for what thing, uh, whether arm or tier of government. So, and this is why one of the things, these are um, on our own end, we are doing our own bit to change the situation. For example, 
from um, we have had we've had a running um, series on TV, five minutes uh, series in which we explain an aspect of democracy, and it's been on channels TV for us from November last year until June, and it's on our YouTube channel. But also over the past six weeks, we have had a project called the People's Assembly, where and this is a very grassroots focus, where we go to select um, certain local governments, we bring together an assembly of citizens groups, um, market association, market association, artisans, and so on, with elected local government representatives to sit down and discuss what are the challenges of the local government. That's the citizens telling the local government representatives, these are the issues that are plaguing them. And then sitting and then looking at what the local government can do regarding um, those challenges. We started it in Lagos in 2022, and we're expanding to Ekiti and Oyo State. And we begin to show results because we need to involve the people at the grassroots directly in local governance. Uh, we are seeing, in, for example, in the local government, a road that was constructed based on the request of the people. Um, in Surulere Suru local government, there's a primary health care center that came out from those kind of deliberations. Um, in, indeed, there's a lot of work or room for citizens to be more involved in our democracy, and not just at focusing on the federal government, also on the state government, also on state uh, local, um, local government, also on the legislatures at these different levels, and also understanding who to channel the demands to regarding um, the particular issues that they have in, in, in uh, my right and just focusing only at the federal government. It's not a particular responsibility from the federal government. The federal government has a has an outsized role to play in our democracy and governance in terms of, because the actions and the optics that they create has reverberates across the country, has um, impacts down the line. Um, but it's really important that we also know that perhaps that road you're looking at connects one village to another, you know, because government might be responsibility of the government, or perhaps that problem you have needs solved, might be something that needs a law to be made uh, or amended, and that's, the legislature, whether it's state level or the uh, federal level. Well, well, speaking about the three tiers of government and the roles that they play, and particularly the local government uh, areas, recently an autonomy was granted to local government councils or areas in the country, which has been met by a lot of kickback by most state governors. Now, we all know that in most states, local government chairmen are mostly incapacitated to do the infrastructure or uh, constituency projects that they are supposed to do in their local government areas due to stifling grip by state governors on the funds that they can have access to. And now with the autonomy, local government areas will be getting direct allocations given to them by the federal government, not necessarily going through the pockets of the state government. With this new development, what major change do you think local government chairmen can effect in our local government area councils, considering that in the, in the grassroots, they are the closest to um, the, the, the masses? Well, 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 well. yes, carry on. I, sorry, I lost you for a bit. My network uh, went off for a moment. That, that, that's really? fine. So, so I was I was reiterating that um, local government autonomy has been granted to area councils or local government councils in the country, and we all know how difficult it has been for local government chairmen to carry out the their duties effectively in local government areas due to the stifling grip by state governors on the allocations that is supposed to be going to these LGAs. But now with the autonomy, they are going to be getting direct allocations from uh, the, the federal government. What different thing do you think that local government chairman would begin to do and what change would should, you know, citizens or residents in local government areas expect with this new development? Well, so, I, I, of course, the lo local government autonomy is a very welcome development, something that Nigerians have been clamoring for for a very, very long time. Um, and like you said, the fact that they're going to be getting the allocations directly to them and they don't have to go cap in hand begging for it from their state governors, it gives them, frees them up to be able to implement programs um, and projects that will impact the people at the grassroots. But then we should also not, um, by itself, 
um, we, it won't be enough. We also need citizens to come together and, like you said, hold them accountable in terms of um, engaging with um, their local government representatives, in terms of putting an eye on them, in terms of um, making the demands that they need to make from them. Um, so, for example, this People's Assembly I referenced earlier is a very, very important tool that we want other people to also copy and replicate in terms of how they uh, to use and engage with their um, local representatives. That's very, very important. In terms of how do you use information? How do you use, such as, for example, how much your local government gets every month in allocation? How do you use that to engage with um, your local government in terms so that you can able to know that this money that you have, this quantum of money or funds that you have received, you need it to be done to this. This is how you're managing it. And this is not, and for us, for us Iaga, right beforehand, we've been trying to build the capacity of citizens to do that. Um, three years ago, we did a project called Bounce Corruption, which focused on training citizens at grassroots to track projects um, from at the grassroots level, to put an eye on them, to able to understand so that um, they hold their local government accountable. And these structures, with these there are things that we need to expand and we'll have other goals to replicate in their own way. Um, but it's not going to be enough. So we should not just think that the fact that local governments now have autonomy means it's um, we are now going to reach the promised land and um, they'll just do the prayers they need to do. We need to also keep an eye on them. We also need to work with them to build capacity because decades of local governments not being enabled to do the work they're supposed to do has robbed them of opportunity to build their capacity to deliver um, good governance at the grassroots. It will come automatically. And so this will say a challenge for us as citizens, as CSOs, as NGOs, as movement partners, to see how we can work with local governments to build their capacity to deliver good governance in their areas. Well, well Mr. Mark, we all know that um, elections in Nigeria don't come cheap. Vying for political positions cost humongous amounts of money. And that is why sometimes when during elections, you'd find that only people with you know, a considerable high amount of money are even able to contest. Uh, thereby, when they get elected into, po into power, what they are after is not really providing the dividends of democracy, but rather recouping the monies that they have spent in vying for elections. How can we make elections in Nigeria not as expensive as it currently is and more accessible to citizens who have, you know, the right mindset the right uh, 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 mental tool to be able to get into these positions of power and deliver their deliverables? I think the first step is to really fight corruption, not just by paying lip service. Uh, what you just described here is pure and simple corruption, people trying to recoup the expenses from election. So, and that's, we have more or less allowed or adjusted to the fact that it will happen and it shouldn't be. So we need to start by fighting corruption by ensuring that public funds or office are abused by people who are elected so they recoup investments that they made by running for office. Second step is to build truly people-centered and people-driven political parties. What we have currently are only political parties in names. In name. They are, they are at best just platforms to get into office. No, and I make this claim boldly, no political party in Nigeria can truly say to be owned by its members where members play a role in decisions where they commit contributions to the running of the party but what, what you, what, why do why do you think so so what you have is a few people few big wigs who control things and it also plays a huge role in how we see people waking up sleeping in one party or keeping another party cross carpeting at will because the fact that those parties were not really are not built or people owned there's no ideology that sets them apart from one party from the other. So in that kind of situation where you have people, um, these parties that are not um, owned by its members and are just platforms to get into office. And so you have these parties that know, the, when they know their power, they said this, could have commercialized our politics, set insanely high fees for nomination forms and the rest, not because, not because they, as they claim, want to have money to run the party, but because they want to create a barrier for people to run is a filter, is a selection, is a filtering method. So if you're able to pay, for example, to run for a governor of myself to pay 50 million or 35 million naira to run, it means if I'm able to pay that admission fee for, I cannot have access to the table to sit at the table, you know, and that shouldn't be. 
we have it, they have, they have intensely commercialized our politics and it's not just it's means a lot of people who have good intentions who have the capacity to run are unable to but it also starts from building parties that are really owned by the people and are driven by the members not by a few people that are in in back rooms and 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 um, and make those decisions well, well what are your thoughts on on electoral reforms like the the need for nigerians in diaspora to be able to vote from any part of the world that they are currently in it has been a call that has been made by uh, a lot of well-meaning nigerians People outside of Nigeria want to vote, but they can't vote unless they are in the country. A lot of other nations have advanced way beyond that, where as a citizen or a registered voter, you can vote from any part of the world. But it appears to not be the same here in the country. What are your thoughts with regards to this? I think it's, we're way past the time for, um, we're long overdue, I mean, for to have the diaspora voting. The Nigerian diaspora are a very, very important segment of our society. Yeah, and it's very clear in how much remittance, for example, they send back to they send back home. They also clear about how they open up opportunities for other Nigerians internationally. How they also contribute to governance in terms of yeah, the ideas, the conversation conversations we have. To so insist that they have to come back home physically to vote, it's in a in a world that we have to deal with many other countries, even within Africa. So Africa has diaspora voting, for example. Is a misnomer that needs to change, and that's just one of the many reforms that we hope should be done to our electoral process. Another reform we need is early voting. Um, for example, every year we have lots of people who are unable to vote um, in, in the millions: electoral workers, observers, security agents who are unable to vote on election day because they are participating, they are playing their role to ensure a smooth electoral process. And it's we should not an electoral process should not exclude people sure those people are offering uh um uh being part play their role in nature building and the electoral process itself early voting also one reform that we hope we are pushing for that persons who are unable to cast their vote on election day because of either they're indisposed or because of their part they are participating in the electoral administration process should we have should have the opportunity to cast their votes prior to that day all right, uh, Mr. Mark, thank you. But I will still come back to you to get your take as we look to wrap up this segment of the program. Coming back to you, Mrs. Essex, a lot of people would argue that the cost of governance in Nigeria is extremely high at the federal level, the state level, and even the local government uh, uh, level. And somehow this is causing an impediment in how these monies sort of trickle down to the grassroots. What do you make of the high cost of governance? I mean, people have attacked uh, uh, SSAs to, to, to government officials or people who have assistants, who have assistants and assistants. It's an age-long menace or problem in Nigeria. How would you address this? I believe a majority of Nigerians would want to get your take on it. Thank you. I think it's not, reducing the cost of uh, governance is not just limited to the numbers of SSAs that the government has. It's about what is their portfolio, what yes. they're meant to do. And, you know, we have different, you know, the Senate president also has eight, and all the senators has a minimum of five eights, uh, five SLAs yes. that are attached to them. So it's also, you know, when we started about addressing the issue of uh, governance, so we said we wanted to fulfill the Orosoya year policy in terms of merging different agencies that are also doing similar things. And I think that's the way we are going to address the level of governance, yes. is to see how we can merge and also have ease of business, doing businesses where agencies who are having similar intervention in helping register businesses are together in the same environment and helping to ease those level of business. So from the government angle, uh, we're using that uh, to reduce that. And you could see uh, also recently that the president also reduced the number of people traveling because we also realized that, you know, a lot of our people in the cabinet are also used there. Um, they've been traveling a lot and it's also putting high cost on governors. Yes. And for three months, I'm sure you are aware that the president stopped that, that, you know, we need to reduce the level of uh, international travel because, you know, flight tickets have doubled. 
and you know it's also impending on the cost of governance and you could see also as well the president has also reduced the type of uh, international engagement and the number of people that travels with him yes. he has reduced that you know of more than 50 percent to say okay this for a president just minimum of 20 people who are related to the cause of what they're doing outside the country should be allowed to join and we've seen evidence on that so from the government angle that's what we're doing to reduce the cost of government now now i believe in that you you also um are aware of the story making the rounds in the news recently uh you know where serap uh sued uh, the president of the Senate, as well as uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, due to salary fixing uh, to the tune of about 21 million naira, which many Nigerians, when they heard of it, called it quite outrageous. Issues like this sort of make people begin to lose faith in the system, considering that there was a, there was a time when the House of Representatives, or the National Assembly in general, said that they were going to take a 50% salary cut in order to alleviate the sufferings of Nigerians. However, that never happened mm. due to what they called bureaucratic impediments. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you tell Nigerians? I mean, you are the representative of the government here. I'm representative of the president. Of the president, yes. Yeah, so we have different representatives from the National Assembly, which I'm sure they could speak on that. Because I'm sure the, the, the salary... Thing is more about the allowances, yes. not about the basic salary. Exactly. So, what are the allowances? Can we have a critical look at it and see? Okay, well, this can actually be uh, removed or be cut down. Is something that we can also appeal. So they will also have constitutional review to review some of these things. And it's a platform where they will have town hall meetings and you know public hearing on some of these things. And I think it's an opportunity for citizens to also hear their voice out. To, for the National Assembly members to make their salary open and transparent for scrutiny and also see how they can cut costs also in government from the National Assembly. I, I, mean, I mean, certainly the salary is quite low. It, it, it's, it's a minute number in the larger 21 million naira, uh, as, uh, you know, entire pay that Serap is suing them for. Yeah, it's oh, more oh, of the, the allowances. The, exactly, it's more of the allowances. So what makes up for this humongous figure are the allowances mm. how can we cut down on these allowances why do they need 21 million naira in a month when the lowest nigerian worker and 70,000 naira which isn't enough to buy a bag of rice as it stands now yeah you know the national assembly people are doing quite different work and i think it's an appeal i'm, I'm sure they're working on something to see how they can also reduce and also appeal because with the economic situation of the country it's not something that the country can afford paying and it's just for them to review and listen to the people because they, they represent the constituency. And it's their constituency asking that, you know, we have better things that we believe should be able to cater for some of those things that is being used as allowances for you. Yes. Which, you know, so just for them to listen to the constituency and see how they can use the voices or what the constituency are saying to review their own salary. So. Now, now, I believe a lot of people would want to know what the role of the judiciary is, uh, mm -hmm. civil society groups and even international organizations in advocating for electoral integrity in Nigeria. If you look at the trend of elections in the country, they have been trailed by a lot of corrupt practices or alleged yeah. corrupt practices. So what are the roles of, one, the judiciary, civil society groups and international organizations like of course yaga africa in um curtailing this uh problem and restoring the integrity of our electoral process yeah so all these institutions you have mentioned are watchdogs you know to help maintain the integrity of the electoral cycle and also to build trust in the process i had a very funny experience why uh, my election you know was in the supreme court and i knew i, I actually won the election but the judgment was another thing which shows the level of corruption at the highest level of judiciary and it's something that we also have to do to hold ourselves accountable to whatever we're doing i could i have my own practical experience and everybody else have their own practical experience saying that their mandates were denied in the judiciary system and it's a call to action to all the judiciary system to see how they can do that and the citizen civil society organizations are also meant to be a watchdog they're not to be partisan. 
in anything. They should, they should make decisions very transparent and open and not to take side. And I think we need our civil society to uphold that and say so we're non-partisan, we review every issues on both sides and hold everyone accountable. This is what I think citizens are expecting from everyone who are meant to hold the, the government accountable to their words and practices. Yes, you know, I, I mentioned Yaga earlier as one of the, um, you know, international organizations who uh, people are looking up to to restore the integrity of our electoral process. So I think uh, it will be right that Mr. Mark reacts to this as well. Mr. Mark, if you're still uh, with us virtually, can you hear me? All right. Well, well, I, I just want to know what the role of Yaga Africa is in ensuring that Nigeria's electoral uh, integrity is restored and the faith and trust that the electorates have for the system is also rebuilt. Yeah, our role is our role is as always been is to engage with those who um, who um, lawmakers, INEC gov government in terms of reforming the electoral process. And this is what we've been doing um, right from time. So immediately after the 2023 elections, we release our reports where we um, look at the electoral process and our observation of the electoral process. And reports on our website called Dash Hopes, question mark. And then in November last year, we organized a citizens town hall in collaboration with the National Assembly, Joint National Assembly Committee on Electoral Reform. And that provided an opportunity for citizens and citizen groups to make the, uh, to submit their proposals, to give their proposals on how the electoral process um, can be reformed. And we we'll continue to uh, have that engagement. We also done a review um, one year after the elections, because as you know, even though the general elections are only are every four years, there are off cycle elections that take place in between these general elections. And it's an, they are an excellent opportunity to um, test reforms before general elections. And so our reports after one year also looked at the off cycle, the rerun elections that INEC conducted, um, you know, in that period. So we continue to engage with law, with um, stakeholders, fellow civil society, with legislature, uh, with INEC, with uh, the executive where it's needed to see how those reforms can be done, and and also provide opportunity for citizens to give their input into these reforms, uh, so that the, uh, we have an improved electoral process. Reforms are not an, are not, um, an activity process, it's a continuous process. And understanding that is why, why we continue to do this at every uh, point in time. Oh, all right. Thank you so much, Mr. Mark Amaza. I must appreciate you for finding the time to join us on the program virtually and to give us your thoughts and perspectives into Nigeria's electoral system and how to better it for the electorates. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, in closing, uh, Mrs. Abiodun Asset, what would you say is the future of Nigeria's electoral system going forward? I believe uh, the future is bright if we all as stakeholders are ready to contribute to this future and not just leaving it in the hands of the government to do. Because it's electoral system is all about the electorate the different agencies have, that has the mandate to make sure there's a free and transparent election and also majorly the government also monitoring the process because it has to be independent so it yes. doesn't have to be interference of any government agency but just something to be deliver the mandate of the people and it's left for all of us to keep holding ourselves accountable and say this is where we're having lapses to review the electoral process we've had election for the past one here how has it been what are the plans for the next election to also avoid the mistakes that might have happened in the past or the errors that might happen in the past so how are we doing it as stakeholders as government agencies as institutions that has a mandate is for us now it's a review process for us to review what has happened and how and what are the provisions that we have as government agency to address those process. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure having this very robust discussion surrounding our electoral process with you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that has been Mrs. Abiodun Esed, who is the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Community Engagement, 
North Central. I've also had on the program Mr. Mark Amaza, Senior Communications Officer at Yaga Africa, and they've both been given their wealth of knowledge into ways of bettering our electoral process in Nigeria and restoring the faith and trust of the electorates in the system.